I've been fascinated by the discovery of the Homo naledi fossils ever since they were announced in 2013. Since then, there's been really one revelation after another. The big mystery is, how did they get there in that cave? While we can't say with 100% certainty that we know the answer, we have a pretty good bread trail, and it was left by the Naledi themselves. There is grandeur in this view of life. Welcome to Evolution Talk with Rick Coast, an introduction to the oldest story ever told. How about a very brief recap to bring everybody up to speed? Every time we think mankind's family tree is complete, scientists discover another branch. Take today, when they introduced us to some new distant cousins. As Deborah Pata shows us, finding them in a South African cave was not easy. They were called underground astronauts, descending to new frontiers deep underground. So deep that only those cavers skinny enough to crawl through the cramped warren of caves were hired. In 2013, Professor Lee Berger announced to the world the discovery of a new species of hominin, the Homo naledi. They were named after the chamber they were found in, the D. naledi chamber. Now, this chamber was incredibly difficult to get to. You know, one had to literally squeeze themselves through areas of the cave system to get to where the bones were found. Berger and his team recovered around 1,500 fossils, which belonged to around 15 individuals. The thing which stumped Professor Berger and his team in the world of paleoanthropology was, how did they get there? The chamber, as I mentioned, is very hard to get to. There's only one way in. It's not something you stumble into by accident. It's 30 meters underground. And even if one individual managed to you know, squeeze themselves through the cave system in complete darkness, the question remains, why? And it wasn't just one individual. This is a group of them. Theories were presented and ruled out. Some of those included running water. Could running water have dumped them there? Well, there's no sign of water either in the past or the present. Another theory is that a predator is responsible, that a predator may have dragged the bodies there. Well, it would take a very cunning and goal-driven predator to pull a body through the near impossible twists and turns it would take to get to the chamber. And on top of that, were a predator involved, one would expect to see the fossilized remains of other animals. Well, that wasn't the case. So, if the Naledi got there themselves, how did they do it? And why? Well, what do we know about the Naledi? Well, it might help to shed some light on them as well. They were small, that they were small enough to make the journey through the cave system, and they were also bipedal. They walked fully upright, and they stood around 5 feet or 1.5 meters tall. On average, they weighed around 100 pounds. They also had much smaller brains than we do, smaller by as much as two-thirds. Our brains are around 1,400 cubic centimeters. The Naledis were about 450 to 600 cubic centimeters, and they lived 335 to 236,000 years ago. And somehow, a group of them navigated their way into a near impossible chamber to reach, which was also far underground. Now, if they didn't get there on their own, who put them there? And then, last year, Professor Lee Berger made this announcement. This morning, we are learning about a momentous discovery that could overturn our understanding of human history. The discovery was made by researchers studying our pre-human ancestors in an area of South Africa known as the Cradle of Humankind. The roof above my head was grayed underneath fresh flowstone, that there were blackened areas across the wall, that there were soot particles across the whole of the surface. The entire roof of the chamber where we've spent the last seven years working is burnt and blackened. Fire. The Naledi appears to have used fire. Now this discovery actually forces us to rethink everything we thought we knew about brain size and intelligence. They managed to control fire and used it to make their way through the cave system. 
Now, that doesn't explain why. Well, it seems we only needed to be patient to maybe get closer to the answer. The Naledi had more secrets to reveal. The Dinaletti situation is also important because it has an interrupted line. You have a, uh, an orange layer, which fortunately f formed about five centimeters down, that's interrupted as the pit was dug by Naledi individuals, and material of that orange layer is then integrated back into the material that surrounds the body. So it's indicating that the bodies were actually, uh, the holes were dug, the bodies were placed in, and then they were recovered with the dirt that was interrupted in the process that it was uh, moving along. What Professor Berger and his team found around the same time they discovered the evidence of fire use were shallow pits on the floor of the chamber containing Naledi remains. And these pits are consistent with the intentional burial of bodies. As Professor Berger explained, the orange layer of sediment that was just below the surface was broken and mixed in with the remains. And next to the hand of one of the apparently interred individuals, a young teenager, was what may have been a stone tool. And that in itself is amazing. If it is a stone tool, we might know what it could have been used for. This discovery is occurring in the hill antechamber. These are very small spaces. That space is only about two and a half to three and a half meters wide. And I'm going to draw you to attention to this pillar that to the right is the passage between the hill uh, antechamber burial chamber and the Dinaletti burial chamber, because on that pillar are rock engravings. Um, they are, you have to remember that there is no evidence other than the, the, the cavers and explorers, my team members that have gone in from the beginning. We actually list the name of everyone that's gone in. There's absolutely no evidence of Homo sapiens or any other species of hominid ever entering these spaces other than our, our cavers, the, the chamber, as far as we know, was unknown prior to our initial work. Um, and there's no evidence of of humans moving past the light zones. And these, uh, these situations, engravings you're seeing, are uh, about 130 meters back into the cave system. Now the revelations keep coming. The Homo naledi not only used fire to light their way through the cave system, they may have done so with the sole purpose of burying their dead. And on top of that, they carved images or symbols into the stone. The lines of the symbols were carved repeatedly, meaning that it wasn't just a random scratch. You had to actually take the point of the tool and repeatedly form that line. And those symbols somewhat resemble the ones made by Neanderthals 60,000 years ago and Homo sapiens in South Africa 80,000 years ago. Intentional designs like these speak to the cognitive development of abstract thinking. And if Professor Berger is right, the Naledi were doing this well over 100,000 years before the evidence found of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens doing the same. These are not natural forms. Um, you can see first the pounding that you see here. These are dug very deeply into the Dolomite. The Dolomite is about 2.9 billion years old here and has a hardness scale of about 4.7 on Mohs hardness scale. Well, that's not as hard as diamonds, but it still takes a lot of effort takes a lot of patience and ambition to carve a symbol into it. These are not uh, minor efforts to do, and you can see what appear to also be pit marks, uh, which have been hammered into this. This was an important part of this one, that the wavy lines you see horizontally are actually stromatolites, uh, fossils that are, are within the rock, and you can see how the carvings actually cross through that, and that the carvers had difficulty in actually carving into this very hard rock with multiple striations. At this time, as I record this, the team's findings are described in three preprint papers. They haven't been officially published or peer-reviewed, but they will soon be in the science journal eLife. So, the Homo naledi continue to fascinate and force us to rethink those who traveled along the Hominin River both before us and alongside of us for a ways. Now, if everything Berger and his team suggests is true, the Naledi were exhibiting behaviors we thought special to only ourselves and the Neanderthals. The intentional burying of one's dead points to a mental capacity that goes beyond basic survival needs. It involves abstract thinking, it involves symbolic thought, 
and maybe even a belief that one's death is a significant event. It implies an understanding of concepts such as mortality, memory, and respect for individuals, even after they're gone. If the Naledi intentionally buried their dead deep in a cave, unreachable by predators and others, it would require a level of sophistication thought impossible for the time. It demonstrates social organization, cooperation, planning, and communication. What if the markings on the wall are actually signposts for others of their kind to follow? A primitive form of, hey, go this way. If so, they had no idea they were pointing the way for others thousands of years later, and for reasons they could never have imagined. We continue to make fascinating discoveries. We continue to make new discoveries. We're not only making them in Rising Star, but at other sites. And to emphasize what I think has been at the center of every talk here, the importance of continuing exploration, the importance of having uh, endemic infrastructure in the places where discoveries might take place. It's no miracle why these discoveries are increasing at these incredible rates. It's because we're working 300 plus days a year. We're there. That's a legacy of something like the Takana Basin Institute. It's a legacy of the investment um, by uh, organizations like National Geographic and others in supporting us explorers where the discoveries might be made. And it's the ethical way forward into the future. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Evolution Talk. I'm Rick Coast. And if you find value in this show, please consider supporting it at evolutiontalk.com. I'd love to keep the show alive, and I can only do so with your assistance. Help spread the word. Share the show with your friends, neighbors, or anyone that you think would be interested. At evolutiontalk.com, you'll find more information, recommended books, and also ways to contact me. I'd love to hear from you, and I hope your week is going well. And until next time, please take care of yourself. Evolution Talk is a Rick Coast production.